Okay, uh, hello everybody. Um, I'm here from Imagination Technologies to talk about PowerVR hardware and uh, give you some of uh, our performance guidelines. Now, um, first of all, um, I'd like to do a brief introduction of what PowerVR is and uh, to introduce the idea of tile-based card rendering, or TBDR. So, PowerVR um, is a brand name of family of graphics IP cores, blah, 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 from Imagination Technologies. That's what the marketing guys told us to stick up there. Um, Historically, we were quite successful in the PC market right at the beginning of um, uh, desktop graphics cards um, with uh, cards like the Cairo and Cairo 2. Um, so later than that, uh, Sega Dreamcast console um, was a PowerVR uh, uh, graphics uh, accelerated device, and um, a lot of people are quite fond of that. But um, after that stage, uh, we um, moved into the uh, mobile market um, and embedded systems, and um, we've been very uh, strong in that sector um, with devices like uh, the uh, iOS series of devices, and numerous Android phones, um, netbooks, um, set of boxes, um, and various other um, uh, devices. Uh, also, the Sony PS Vita is one of our um, cores in it. So, um, in recent times, uh, and basically, since the start of the uh, kind of smartphone uh, revolution, as it were, uh, PowerVR has been present um, in the form of uh, PowerVR MBX, which was our first, uh, third series of um, graphics acceleration call. Uh, that was a fixed function pipeline, so it implemented uh, uh, OpenGL ES1. And uh, some of you may be familiar with that from uh, phones like the uh, Nokia M95 and for the uh, original um, iPhone and uh, iPod Touch. Um, more recently, PowerVR SGX, which is our programmable uh, hardware, basically you can use shaders on it, that's been um, very successful in a lot of devices since then, later iPhones, um, various Android devices, um, and um, increasingly we're rolling out um, our SGX XT hardware, which is basically the multi-core variant of SGX, which I'll get onto a little bit later. And um, we've recently announced PowerVR Series 6, uh, which we're um, already putting into um, hardware uh, that should be available this year, hopefully. Um, and um, if you are in the uh, kind of conference uh, 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 carnival that's coming up, um, you may see some of that um, up here uh, in the, the events that you go and visit, such as GDC or whatever. So, um, uh, what I'd like to explain is a little bit about um, graphics architectures. Now, uh, a lot of you may be familiar with um, uh, immediate mode rendering, which is the standard in desktop and most consoles. Um, it's kind of given away in the name. The idea is that um, your triangles, your geometry data, comes in and it's immediately processed all the way through the graphics pipeline um, and output to the color buffer at the end. And uh, when uh, PowerVR was designing their uh, initial cores, um, they decided that was uh, not a clever enough way of doing it. So um, uh, we, we uh, uh, tried to uh, improve on that process. Um, and so the music mode rendering does um, have a few inherent uh, downsides. Although it's, it's simple to implement and it's been done very successfully, um, it still allows obscure fragments to be processed. You can draw pixels that you don't actually need for the final render. Um, and a lot of um, uh, system memory bandwidth has to be used into uh, graphics memory. This is why uh, immediate mode renderers on desktop have their own dedicated graphics memory. Uh, unfortunately, in mobile architectures, you can't usually afford to have that, whether it's for power considerations or cost or simply space. So um, they tend to have shared memory uh, architectures, and um, any uh, bandwidth used there is um, a real big um, cost uh, for performance. It's generally something you don't want to do. So the um, Read, modify, write, write operations are a downside there. The memory footprint uh, taken for having a whole stencil and depth buffer at the side of your render can be a downside. Now, uh, immediate mode renderers um, try to incorporate uh, early Z techniques, um, various ways of reducing overdraw, but um, to really take advantage of these, the application developer has to try and render their um, geometry from front to back in order to um, stop uh, uh, too many fragments from being uh, obscured by later geometry that's uh, put through the pipeline, the problem of being immediate mode. So, um, one of the other solutions that's in the mobile market is um, something called tile-based rendering. Um, 
where the idea is that you chop up the screen into little tiles that um, can be held in uh, core memory on the chip itself so that uh, instead of having to read out into the main memory um, multiple times and to keep large um, stencil and depth buffers around uh, the graphics hardware can uh, process everything on chip. Now this is faster and evolves, uh, avoids um, accessing memory as I say. Unfortunately uh, without a kind of deferred and intelligent deferred step um, obscure fragments still get processed uh, and this is what uh, happens in some of the other uh, mobile architectures that are available at the moment. Um, so they employ RLZ techniques similar to uh, the immediate mode renderers. Now these are quite effective if the application um, rendering its graphics has uh, ordered its geometry to try and um, take advantage of it, but um, yeah, it still has its downsides. Uh, the other downside with the tile-based re uh, rendering technique is that an intermediate buffer needs to be required. Uh, um, it's, it's required um, if you submit all your geometry um, that won't be submitted tile by tile. It has to be binned into tiles and stored somewhere for later processing. So in effect, tile-based rendering is deferred, but because the deferred step is not particularly uh, sophisticated in the mobile graphics realm, it's, these uh, kind of renderers are known as tile-based renderers and are considered to be non-deferred. So the kind of natural development from there, uh, which um, Power VR implements, is uh, tile-based deferred rendering. Um, and uh, the major difference between that and the previous slide is that uh, we have something called pixel perfect submission order independent hidden surface removal, which again is a, a big mouthful, but uh, basically it means that we try to process all the geometry per tile once we've gathered a scene to try and throw away all the fragments that aren't visible. So if a triangle has been submitted that is in front of another triangle, no matter what order um, the geometry is being passed through, then um, uh, if, if, if the triangle is behind another triangle, um, it shouldn't be drawn. No, none of the fragments resulting from that triangle should uh, contribute to the render. And so that, this means we don't have to process as many fragments, and it means we don't have to read out into memory. And in theory, that means it's a lot uh, faster and more efficient. And it's part of the reason Power VR has been so successful up to now in the uh, embedded space. There is still a downside in that we do have to keep uh, an intermediate buffer space just like the tile-based renderers do, um, although we have worked for 20 years now on trying to make that as efficient and uh, optimal as possible. Now you could ask why doesn't everybody do this um, way of rendering? Um, well, there's two reasons basically. It's quite complicated to implement. Um, we've been trying to iron out all the bugs over the years and to be, to be honest we're quite good at it now. Um, but uh, if you were to try and implement this straight off, um, there may be uh, hidden problems that aren't quite so obvious. Um, the other reason that other uh, manufacturers don't use this technique is because it's covered by patents. Um, and as an IP company, uh, Imagination are quite uh, zealous of their patents. Now I'm going to try and explain how TVDR works a little bit more um, uh, clearly now. So there's basically two render stages. Um, it's very important to understand that there are two stages to every single render on a PowerVR um, core. You have um, your tiling, where um, all the geometry is collected and binned into the separate little areas of the screen, and that's stored in something called the parameter buffer. Now, once you've drawn everything, once the application is called e uh, EGL swap buffers or um, similar to finish the scene, then it's only at this point that we actually rasterize, do our hidden surface removal, and actually process um, the fragments that will be in the scene. And that, that's the deferred step, hence the reason there's a D in TVDR. Now, it's very important to understand that this fragment process doesn't happen until all the scene has been captured. So, one of the reasons we tile is so that we can process um, each of the tile regions uh, separately later. And as I said before, that means we can do most of the operations for a tile entirely on chip. That means we don't have to read out into system memory, which is slow and it's also power hungry, which is very important in uh, the mobile realm. Um, we do this in kind of two um, sections, two step phases. We convert all the geometry into um, screen space coordinates, obviously that way we can tell where on the screen the geometry is going to be and hence it's easier to split it into tiles and that's stored into the parameter buffer into the parameter buffer like that and then 
we do the actual rasterization to see exactly which pixels um, are affected by a polygon. Now, obviously, at the end of this process, once a tile has been rendered, we write the color buffer out to system memory um, so that the display hardware can actually stick it on the screen so you can see it. Now, the uh, kind of clever part is the deferred step, which, as I say, has this hidden surface removal. Now, one of the things we do kind of shout about is the fact that this is uh, independent of submission order. Um, no matter what order you um, submit your triangles to the screen, um, only the, the fragments that are frontmost will um, contribute to the final render. Um, if you've got depth testing switched on, obviously um, if you're not doing depth testing, then um, it obeys submission order too. Now, it's important to understand as well that this is pixel perfect. Because it's done on chip, we can afford to do that kind of very um, precise uh, 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 audit of um, every bit of geometry, whereas other uh, early Z techniques tend to be a, a bit more kind of approximate, and so some overdraw is actually uh, introduced. Of course, in the deferred step, we also shade. Now, as I said before, um, you can see that, uh, a hidden surface removal is designed to get rid of every surface that's not there, so that only fragments that contribute to the scene um, will actually be um, processed. And we have this uh, kind of diagram which shows you that. The idea being that anything that's uh, obscured by a shape in front of it um, doesn't really exist and doesn't actually get drawn. Only the geometry is considered, and then no fragments are actually processed. And all of this really. Um, Apart from the kind of obvious uh, saving in uh, uh, processing, not having to process fragments, it, it, the kind of slightly less obvious um, advantage is that we don't uh, consume memory bandwidth. And um, as any hardware engineer will tell you in the mobile realm, this is the most important thing for uh, performance and also for power consumption, trying not to use um, system memory. I mean, as uh, computer scientists, a lot of you will know um, that uh, memory reads can actually be are, are generally a lot slower than trying to do work in registers. Nowadays, computers are often held up by reading from memory rather than from actually processing um, mathematical operations or whatever. And in this case, uh, with the GPU, it's much the same idea. So, um, if, if we can keep as much on chip as possible, then we are more power efficient and we're more uh, process efficient as well. So um, I'm going to go on to explain a little bit how the actual uh, how the ASIC actually implements this and some of the hardware blocks that are involved. Now this is partly useful because if you ever use any of our um, performance tools, then we refer to these um, in the performance tools. So if um, if you look at the diagram at the top here and see some of the acronyms, they correspond directly to the counters in our PBR2 tool, for instance. Um, and so that you can get some understanding of what those um, statistics actually mean. Um, so essentially, our geometry goes from the left um, to the middle, where it's stored in the parameter buffer. And then in the kind of second step, the deferred step, we um, push uh, the remaining fragments through the uh, other components to the frame buffer. And to do this, we have three main um, modules. We have the TA, which is tiling accelerator, and that's used to do um, essentially the geometry processing and push every all the geometry into the appropriate tile um, for um, fragment processing later. It's also the thing that um, creates the, the intermediate buffer, the parameter buffer, that we use to actually master on, uh, to, sorry, to process um, the scene later. Once um, we've made our parameter buffer and uh, all the geometry has been gathered, then the uh, image synthesis processor does the, um, the magical um, hidden surface removal, the, the, the clever deferred bit. And it uh, then pushes whatever fragments are left into the texture and shading processor, which um, sets up the jobs for um, um, the actual uh, fragment processing later on. And, um, it's important to understand that these blocks are quite high level, and the TSP actually contains many sub-blocks. But um, we found that this is the most useful level to understand for actual um, application development. Now, um, there's two other kind of shared components. There's the, the uh, USSEs. Now, the USSEs are um, general purpose processors. They can do vertex, fragment, and GPGPU instructions. 
Um, and there's a kind of uh, workhorse uh, grunt that actually does the calculations that are needed to draw your graphics. And so, and, important to understand that they're used both in the vertex state, stage and in the fragment processing stage. Um, uh, and also, if you do do GPGPU, there, it actually does uh, that stage as well. Now, uh, the other part that I've talked about a bit already is the parameter buffer, and that's uh, the intermediate buffer that stores uh, the transform geometry for um, processing later on. So um, I'm going to go uh, into a little bit more detail on each of those main blocks. Um, as I've said, the universal uh, scalable shader engine, the USSE, is a general purpose processor. And the idea is basically that uh, instead of having separate dedicated processors, you have uh, one unit which can do uh, more vertex and fragment tasks. And that means that uh, you don't have silicon sitting around doing nothing uh, whilst another part of the, the core is um, overly busy if, um, say, your scene has a more for fragment processing than vertex processing. In fact, that's commonly the case these days. Um, there's one uh, other kind of component that um, I kind of bring in now, which is called the coarse grain scheduler. Uh, and this is the other kind of clever part of the chip. Um, uh, essentially, um, Power VR cores are all about clever processing and about clever scheduling. And um, uh, as um, uh, if you're interested in CPU um, architecture, you'll know that um, scheduling uh, processing is uh, almost as important as having a processor that works really fast in order to keep your um, chips uh, efficient. So um, I talked a little bit about the parameter buffer already, as I say. Um, this is kind of high-level high overview of how uh, it works. Basically, we have um, one store of uh, the actual primitives, and they're, they're stored into primitive blocks. This is the actual transformed uh, vertex triangle data, which uh, you guys have passed in. It's um, processed in the vertex shader, and we put that uh, information there. Um, it's the, the information is separated out so that uh, the, the ISP and the TSP can uh, grab that data efficiently without kind of getting in each other's way and um, redundantly um, reading memory. and um, the other kind of major uh, components of the parameter buffer are the um, display lists. And these um, are basically uh, references into that uh, store of transform geometry in the primitive blocks. So uh, effectively, we store um, uh, a list of references to uh, uh, the geometry that you've passed in, rather than storing, say, uh, multiple copies of the geometry. Um, and this becomes relevant if you have triangles which um, cross over multiple tiles. So um, you store, say, one triangle um, and several uh, references to it for each of the tiles that um, that triangle affects. And that's been shown to be more effective in our uh, opinion. Now, the uh, component that builds the parameter buffer is the tile accelerator. And this does all the kind of normal stuff you'd expect of um, uh, the kind of first stages of a graphics pipeline in that it clips, projects, and culls. It takes the transform data and decides if it's actually going to be on the screen. Um, but um, as I say, it makes the, uh, the primitive blocks and display lists and fills up the uh, parameter buffer. Now, the number of tiles is determined um, in a fairly natural way. We only have so much room on every um, core uh, to uh, process data. So um, in the design phase, it's decided how many fragments um, are actually going to be kept on core at any time. And that determines the size of the tiles. Uh, typical sizes are, say, um, 16 by 16. Although on later processors, um, this is getting larger as the, the, the cores are getting larger and the process technology is getting smaller. So um, our later cores are, say, 32 by 32. But um, they're not you know, huge chunks. They're not like the uh, macro tiles and so, uh, other systems, for instance. Now, um, the next step in, in the pipeline after the parameter buffer has been created is the uh, image synthesis processor. And as I mentioned before, this does the hidden surface removal. It also does things like depth and stencil tests. But um, because we're a tile-based renderer, uh, we can do this on chip, so there's no reading in and out of uh, depth or stencil buffer that's kept in main memory. Now, um, once the, uh, a fragment passes all these tests, the hidden surface rule, depth and stencil, then we, we put it into something called a tag buffer, and that's a way of kind of grouping fragments that are actually going to need to be processed uh, into um, uh, sets that are uh, kind of 
coherent. They, they may have the same shader, the same uh, uh, texture, very similar state, and that means that we um, should be able to process them more efficiently later on when um, we pass through to the uh, TSP. Now, one thing to note is, is that if we can do a depth and decimal uh, operations on chip, then we don't really need the information later unless the uh, application uh, specifically uh, requests it. Now, unfortunately, the, the graphics APIs are set up to be kind of the opposite way around. Um, but if, as a developer, if you say that you don't need the depth and stencil information later, then uh, we can um, save all that uh, reading in and out of um, the, the core, and that can be quite a major uh, performance uh, optimization. Obviously, we do have to write out the colored information, because otherwise you wouldn't see anything on your screen. So. Um, the TSP, the texture and shading processor, is uh, uh, the kind of uh, uh, part that sets up all the actual fragment processing. It doesn't do it itself. It uses the USSE uh, to do that, the shader processors there. But it does things like um, programming iterations from uh, different vertices and uh, between different vertices in the same triangle in order to give all those um, varying values that you need in your shaders. Um, it lines up texture fetches, which is a very important thing. Um, uh, reading textures are kept in main memory. Reading from main memory is slower than um, reading on chip registers. So if um, RTSP can line up those texture branches ahead of time, that means that data can be there for the USSC to process when it gets to um, that stage in your fragment shader and doesn't have to wait. Um, so uh, this is what um, is referred to as an independent read. Uh, dependent reads are ones that can only be calculated in the fragment shader itself, and at that point the uh, shader uh, processor has to wait for uh, the uh, texture information to come from main memory, and so they're non-desirable. Um, so uh, the texture TSP here is the bit that um, can hopefully um, you know, avoid that kind of suboptimal um, processing. Even if you have things like dependent reads or um, other uh, uh, slowing uh, uh, operations, we um, have quite a lot of clever thread shuttling code, uh, so not code, thread shuttling hardware in uh, our cores uh, so that the USSC shouldn't be too blocked. They should um, be able to um, uh, get around any stalls to a certain extent by m maintaining multiple um, threads at a time. Now, it so happens that instruction latency is uh, four clocks for um, the SGX course, so we keep four um, threads going at any one time. Um, due to some of our other uh, technology, um, we're very capable of um, uh, switching in these threads with no uh, overhead, and so um, we keep a, a store of 16 in total. And that means that uh, should uh, a shader come to a stalling operation where it needs uh, information from main memory or whatever, then we can quickly um, shove through uh, another uh, thread and uh, it can keep part of the process. Now obviously um, this can hide quite a lot of stalls but um, it's not perfect so as developers you can still um, try and avoid uh, doing bad operations but you know, rest assured we don't uh, you know, do nothing to try and help you. Uh, later cores are going to be even more clever in this way. Um, this is um, mostly relevant to the current SGX cores. Talking of um, different types of core. Um, as I mentioned at the start, we have STX, which is quite familiar to um, Android and iOS developers. We have also uh, got uh, STX XT, which is our multi-core um, architecture. And uh, um, this is uh, beginning to come through device, into devices, and some of which um, you may be familiar with already. Um, and uh, basically, it is just um, multiple STXs on a chip with a little bit of hardware to um, kind of mine them. Um, now, we get a lot of questions asking about whether this means that um, there are um, situations where uh, one core is holding up um, uh, the rest of the processing. Um, we don't find that happens very often because, uh, as you can see in the slide, we kind of uh, push the work around dynamically. Um, if uh, a, t a, a core finishes um, processing a tile, and uh, then it will get another tile from uh, the list of jobs that's been kind of stacked up. And so um, you, you, the only kind of situation where you might be limited by a single tile is if that tile had more geometry and more processing required than any uh, all the rest of the tiles in the screen put together. And, and that's pretty unlikely in a normal kind of render. 
uh, especially with the kind of resolutions that are being processed on modern devices now. And the great thing is um, also that you don't have to worry about this as application developers because it's all handled in the hardware. Now, some of you may be thinking I should have said it's handled in the driver, but it's actually really handled in the hardware um, because uh, the SGX uses a microkernel design. Now, unlike a kind of traditional architecture where you would have a, a driver that runs in the CPU and it um, tells a, a, an essentially dumb GPU to go off and do uh, jobs and uh, it's very much kind of uh, remote controlled, uh, the SGX is uh, kind of semi-autonomous in that it has a, a kind of mini operating system running on it in the form of this microkernel. This runs on one of the USSEs in the system. And the idea is that um, if uh, our SGX can run independently as much as possible, then um, it isn't blocked by CPU tasks. Um, there's less need to uh, communicate and synchronize between the uh, SGX and the CPU. And that even uh, minimizes uh, the amount of system memory bandwidth that's used by the core. And uh, yeah, this has been very successful for us. Um, so far, and um, we're, um, this is a kind of uh, a solution that we're going to be increasingly using in uh, later chips. So um, I'd just like to go over the kind of pipeline uh, again, uh, just to give you a kind of uh, overview of how uh, the SGX works. Um, as I said before, uh, your application submits all its geometry, and this gets um, uh, processed by the USSEs uh, in vertex shaders, that's where transform lighting happens. Um, once the position information is calculated, then the TA takes that and uh, does the kind of normal clip projection cull operations and then tiles it as well. And that means that uh, we can create this uh, parameter buffer. Now, once you've finished uh, submitting all your geometry, all your drawing operations have gone through, then uh, you um, we move on to the next stage it's just a kind of rasterization step, the deferred step, and that's where we take the parameter buffers that we've uh, made up already, and the SGX um, will do the hidden surface removal in the ISP, all the on-chip um, work with the depth of stencil uh, data, and then the resulting fragments, the ones that should actually contribute to the render, are pushed into the TSP, that sets up all the fragment shading jobs, tries to uh, fetch as many textures um, ahead of time as possible, and then pushes all those jobs to the uh, USSEs again to um, process the fragment shaders and things like blending happen then as well um, on, in the on-chip color buffer and then there's a tiny little bit of the architecture called the pixel backend which is responsible for things like dithering and downsampling uh, if you're in the 16-bit buffer for instance and that pushes the data out into the frame buffer and from there uh, the display hardware will take it and you'll see uh, the frame on your screen. For a hardware engineer, um, it looks a little bit like this. Um, the kind of uh, way to imagine this is that uh, everything has to go from system memory back to system memory again. So there are kind of multiple passes through the hardware. So um, initially, you've got geometry information that comes from system memory, goes through the vertex data master, um, gets pushed through the USSEs to the tile accelerator at the top right there, and then the tile accelerator uh, uh, makes the uh, primitive blocks and display lists to form the param uh, parameter buffer, which is back in main memory again. And then at the end of uh, your uh, scene, um, the, fragment, uh, the fragment processing starts, the first step starts, and then that parameter buffer information is pushed from main memory into the ISP at the left there, through the coarse grain schedule again to the USSEs. They do all their fragment processing um, with help from the texture and coprocessor. The resultant fragments go to the pixel back end and that's written back out into memory again. Now the other path that's there is showing uh, microkernel instructions and uh, you can see how that might work uh, yourselves. I think. Now there are a few other considerations. Um, alpha blending. Uh, it's all very well saying that the frontmost pixel should be the only one that uh, actually contributes to the C, but if uh, that frontmost uh, pixel or fragment is uh, transparent uh, or uh, translucent, then uh, you'd want to be able to see something behind it. Now, uh, that's accomplished by uh, blending, as uh, any graphics programmers know. Power VR has a kind of reputation for being uh, not so good at this, but it's, it's a little unfair since um, it's basically the case that we're particularly good at rendering opaque uh, 
uh, fragments, but we're um, still pretty good at uh, blended fragments because we can do all the processing on chip, and that means we don't write, read and write out to uh, main memory, so we don't consume power and we do it very quickly. Um, it so happens that uh, rendering things in the right order um, helps a lot with this. I'll get onto that later. Some of you in uh, the audience may have uh, worked out that there may be a downside to this technique. Um, if uh, you're making an intermediate buffer in uh, uh, main memory uh, and you haven't assigned a big enough buffer for that, then you may be in trouble if you fill it up. Now, um, it's true that this isn't great for performance, but it's generally mitigated by a few factors. One is that um, the size of the buffer is usually chosen pretty carefully so that a well-behaved application never actually hits this state. The other thing is that um, we've been handling this uh, situation for years now, and it's really not the end of the world as far as performance goes. You might see a, a kind of a, a noticeable step down if you're uh, profiling an application, but uh, it, it isn't the case that you'll go from you know, 60 frames per second to uh, 2 uh, just because of hitting uh, parameter buffer management. And there are a few other kind of little side things which are quite useful um, that you can get it if you process on, on tile. Um, because we do all our blending on tile, then it's uh, trivial for us to do all the blending at 32 bits of precision. So if you have multiple blended layers, then um, we always do this, these operations at a high level of precision, so you can't see um, the kind of artifacts that you might get from doing a lot of lower precision calculations, um, such as in an IMR where you have a 16-bit buffer. So we avoid a lot of... Um, banding and dithering artifacts that you might get from that kind of thing. Also, um, we uh, have a hardware um, anti-aliasing, which is uh, performed on chip. Um, essentially, we um, quarter the size of the tile. So um, on very, very large uh, resolutions, you get a lot of tiles being processed this way. But to be honest, we find the biggest kind of uh, thing that um, affects how fast, uh, how much effect this has on your uh, render is uh, the amount of geometry. It's very geometry dependent. The number of edges in a tile um, dictates how uh, much uh, extra processing needs to be done. Now, um, for the modern, more modern cores, um, we generally kind of recommend you switch it on and see. Um, you might find that um, you get a much uh, nicer looking render um, for not a lot more um, processing uh, overhead, and so it might be worth using anti-aliasing, especially you know now that uh, modern applications really are, you know, beginning to look um, very nice and not kind of basic uh, renders like they were uh, several years ago. I'm going to mention this one here. I'm going to mention it later. Um, PowerVR um, offers a, a kind of industry-leading texture compression, um, where the only uh, uh, architecture that's currently allowing you to compress two bits per pixel with a full alpha channel, for instance. And uh, given that um, in a recent study I saw 50% uh, of, um, uh, of the uh, memory bandwidth that was used in a, a game, a modern application, uh, was texture um, data, it seemed um, like a wise plan to try and uh, minimize the size of that as much as possible. We've also um, done a lot of work on the compressors for this, and there are quite a lot of exciting developments going on. Um, with regard to PBRDC, which are coming up, um, and you should see those in a couple of months. So um, you should be making life a, a little easier for developers that want to use this technology um, there. So in conclusion, PowerVR has uh, an intelligent tile-based deferred rendering design, which is all kind of uh, groomed to uh, enable uh, the smallest amount of uh, system memory bandwidth overhead, and that saves power and it uh, increases performance. Um, we have our pixel perfect uh, hidden surface removal, um, which is uh, not uh, dependent on submission order. We have a scalable architecture. Um, uh, SGX cores alone go from um, really quite uh, basic devices, which are small uh, smartphones with uh, small resolutions, through to um, set up boxes, which are now uh, pushing uh, 1080p screens. So it's uh, been very effective as a scaling architecture. And we have um, a few kind of ex extra bonuses in uh, internal true color. Um, our multi-sampling anti-aliasing on chip and our PBRTC texture compression. Now, I'd like to go briefly into um, a kind of general optimization approach um, and some uh, kind of pointers on um, how to uh, optimize your graphics. I'll try to mention where some of these uh, techniques are PowerVR specific, um, although most of this stuff is useful for any kind of graphics work. 
So, um, one thing uh, I'd like to go into first of all is just a kind of, as I say, a general approach. Um, uh, when optimizing graphics, it's um, crucial to understand the, uh, the concept of a bottleneck. Somewhere in this pipeline, where all the geometry is going through all the way to um, the pixels at the end, uh, there is going to be the weakest point of your rendering system, the, the bit that's working hardest, and that's going to be the part that's holding up um, the rest of the processing. Now, if you're going to do any optimization work, it's crucial that you work in that um, area and not somewhere else. Um, otherwise, the only thing you'll uh, 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 manage to do is um, have the, your application run at the same speed, um, but potentially you'll cut down the number of triangles when you're actually fragment limited so that your um, display will actually look worse. So it's very important to understand where you should be working. Now, the way to do this is to profile. Um, we have uh, performance tools that we um, give you now for free. Um, we have a PBR Tune um, profiler and uh, PBR Trace, which is an API uh, analysis utility that we've done a lot of work on recently. Other manufacturers have uh, profiling tools as well. Apple have their own profiling tools, for instance. And um, you really want to use these as much as you can, and from a very early stage, just to see what's going on in your core. And if you find that it's a particular part of the uh, pipeline which is at 100% load, whatever, then uh, that's where you need to start um, concentrating your uh, effort. And it's also important to understand that you need to reprofile because once you've worked in uh, a bottleneck for a while, um, it may be that you've sped up that area so much that uh, it's actually another part of the pipeline that's holding you back. So um, you need to kind of follow this iterative um, procedure in order to uh, optimize your code. Um, hopefully, you won't use go-to's in your code. Uh, I've used one there just uh, to uh, keep it simple. Now. The other thing to do is um, to um, be aware of the kind of uh, most likely uh, occurrences um, and to draw on um, people's experience, um, uh, which is why I, I'm, I'm giving you this kind of lecture and why I say look at our documents um, about this topic. We most often see that applications are actually CPU limited, and that sounds a little bit like we're uh, fobbing off all the problem on. Uh, on the, the guys who make the CPUs, but it may be that it's actually the number of draw calls, it's the driver that's um, actually holding up your rendering. Um, so you've got to be aware it's not just uh, other code like uh, uh, physics or uh, AI that's holding up your, um, your your application, it may be uh, the number of draw calls you're making. Then after that, it's a texture cache and texture fetches. This is why um, texture compression is so important. Uh, after that, fragment shader instructions do seem to be the most uh, common thing. Um, because uh, nowadays there's way more uh, fragments, way more pixels on the screen than um, usually there are uh, vertices being drawn. And so um, that test tends to be the part that's actually holding up your render. And it gets less likely all the way down. Some of these um, my boss claims to have seen, but I have never seen. Uh, I've never seen the ISP being um, the uh, part that's holding up the rendering, but um, some of the guys have. It's quite unlikely that is the case, so it's useful to kind of have um, you know some kind of rough guideline to understand what you might be looking at. Now, it's all very well saying um, write your application, profile it, and then reprofile and stuff, but um, it's probably quite useful as a developer to have some idea where to start. So we provide our golden rules, um, and the idea is that if you follow all these golden rules, um, you have a pretty good chance of writing an application that doesn't need a great deal of work to actually be successful. So, golden rule number one, understand your target platform. Now, this might seem really obvious, and in fact it is, but um, it's things like understanding the version of the OS that's on the platform, the, uh, the core that's actually in, in the device, the size of the screen, the resolution of the screen, um, whether it's going to output to uh, an HD um, TV, uh, potentially, things like that. Um, it, it's good to uh, learn as much as you can about this kind of thing. And if you can't find it out from say, the manufacturer's website, then um, why not ask um, people like us or um, you know, the other guys that uh, work in graphics. That's our uh, email address there if you're interested. Rule two is uh, the principle of good enough, um, which is uh, basically uh, much easier to say than to write a slide on, I discovered. Um, the, the principle is that um, the only uh, thing that judges whether your graphics are successful is how good it looks to the user. So don't worry about doing you know, a physically accurate simulation if um, you can get away with something which is um, you know, kind of grade level maths that um, looks great. Um, if uh, 
you know that uh, the um, sign that's um, going to take up uh, 10 pixels on the screen for the user actually has a, a texture that is a blurred mess, but it looked great, then don't use a bigger texture. All you're doing is wasting resources. So, um, yeah, it's very um, important to kind of chase that uh, idea of making it look good enough so that the graphics architecture doesn't have to do more work than it should. And this applies all the way through. Obviously, on more powerful um, platforms, you can do more physically accurate rendering. But um, it's important to understand that even in the fanciest ray traced, um, you know, radiosity generated um, pre-rendered uh, feature films, they are cheating. They're not actually you're not actually looking at real light on real objects. Rule three, and this one's getting a bit more kind of specific to uh, real time rendering. Don't access the render target. Um, from the CPU that you want to draw to from the GPU. In fact, it's better if you can just draw everything with the GPU entirely. It's even a lot worse than it might seem um, because it completely ruins uh, the parallelism between the CPU and the GPU. It's, it would, it's like uh, having uh, any kind of situation where you have more than one core and making um, each core wait for the other. Um, it's uh, generally a bad idea. This used to be rule number one, but um, in some ways, it's engineering rule number one still. So. Rule four, prompt calculations up the chain. Now, the most simple way of saying this is that there's uh, a lot more um, fragments on your, say, 1080p screen than there are going to be vertices in your scene. Um, so if you can do your calculations per vertex instead of per fragment, then you're doing your calculations a lot fewer times, and so you're making a saving. Um, if you can do that calculation once um, per frame on the CPU, then that's a saving. If you can do that calculation once in your, on your development device um, back in your studio, then that's a saving for the guy who's using the, your application on his um, phone or whatever. Now, obviously, uh, some of these um, kind of uh, passing up the chain ideas are, are going to have uh, limitations. Um, and particularly if you're CPU limited, you may want to actually pass work to the GPU. Um, and also, if uh, bandwidth is short, then uh, reading, say, a lookup table is going to be more of a problem than actually calculating it in a shader. But um, it's worth considering this kind of idea if you are try just trying to make your graphics faster. Golden Rule 5 is use VBOs and VAOs and things like that. Um, generally, if you've been given more sophisticated object types for your rendering, then you should um, you take advantage of them as much as possible. This allows the driver to do things like prepare um, the VBO in driver memory so it doesn't have to read into uh, user space to actually draw. It means it can um, prep all the data in an order that it likes so that uh, when you say draw that VBO, it will do it faster and there is less processing to do before uh, you actually get the geometry into uh, the, the core. Rule uh, six, batch your drawing operations. Um, I think the diagram at the bottom is quite simplistic, but uh, it does try and get the, uh, the idea across. Um, uh, every time you pass a call to the GPU, we do a lot of work to try and make this efficient, but there's still going to be set up work before each call can actually be um, processed on. You know what it's like yourselves. If you're working, if somebody gives you lots of little tasks one at a time, then you get kind of caught up in uh, uh, the kind of administration of it. Whereas if somebody gives you a list, then um, you can work a lot faster. And there's lots of uh, kind of strategies to uh, make this work. Um, if you've got uh, objects which are of the same state, and draw them together. If um, you can uh, group uh, objects and uh, group uh, their textures into an atlas, it's so basically just a big texture um, which has multiple small textures on it, and do that as well. Um, uh, brand, uh, brand, batching uh, in graphics is um, one of the most common uh, optimizations that you can do. And it's also worth bearing in mind on Power VR that because we don't uh, re uh, rely on the submission order for our hidden surface removal, then you can uh, batch by state as much as you like. Uh, I've mentioned texture compression already. Um, it's so important that it comes into this talk twice. So here it is again. You use it on everything if you can. The big guys um, use it on every single texture. The, people, the epics and the unities of this world, it's very much an exceptional case where they use anything else. Um, the other uh, kind of texture optimization is uh, to use mitmaps. Now, they take up a little bit more memory, but because of uh, the fact that you've got small textures for small um, areas of the screen, um, that means that the texture catch 
can be used a lot more uh, efficiently, and so um, you can draw uh, less work is actually um, done by the GPU. Less system memory is used, and memory bandwidth is used, and so um, you get a big, massive saving in uh, in processing time. Now, rule number eight: avoid alpha test and discard. Now, this is true for everyone. Um, but it's very true for Power VR. It removes some of the, the things that we can do uh, in, with our hidden surface removal, basically because um, we can only work out if a fragment is visible at uh, fragment processing time, and so we have to push stuff back up the pipeline uh, to find out um, whether uh, fragments are actually uh, visible or not. And so it's um, generally just a, a don't do that kind of uh, thing. Uh, and my colleague likes to say, friends don't let friends use alpha test. And, uh, on the whole, I agree. Uh, Goal rule nine is um, specific to Power VR as well, uh, and is basically uh, the idea that you render all your opaque geometry first. If you're going to do any kind of discard or alpha test, you do that second, and then you render your blended uh, geometry um, last. And that, that means that we can process it uh, most efficiently. It's just a simple kind of cookie cutter rule that way. Go rule 10, we're almost there, is to use um, clears and to use um, extensions like uh, ext discard frame buffer, um, because that means that we don't have to uh, read in information from memory before we process a tile, and we don't have to write it out once we finish with the tile. So um, we don't have to keep a depth buffer in memory if you're not going to use depth between scenes, which is um, pretty uncommon, to be frank. Um, and we don't have to write it out to memory uh, in case um, it gets used later. But um, unfortunately, the APIs kind of require you to say this explicitly. It's a good idea to clear um, on every architecture, and this discard frame buffer thing is very important on PowerVR cores. Uh, Golden Rule 11 is PowerVR specific as well. Favor sensor operations. We can do sensor operations on chip. Um, that means we don't read out into memory. We do everything um, as fast as the, the processors can do it. And um, it means that we can do um, more flexible stuff than, say, using scissor operations or something like that. You're not reduced to um, using rectangles. So if you can think of something clever with the stencil buffer, then feel free to do it on a, a Power VR. And the last um, golden rule is never forget the giant green battery. Try and target a sensible frame rate. Um, steady frame rates give better experiences, and there's no, there's no reason to um, render a static user interface um, 60 times a second if it's not going to change, and you can render it once. And then when a uh, user touches the screen, then you start rendering again, and that will save tons of power and will free up the rest of the system to get on with um, other stuff. Um, we found that if you have a fluctuating, fluctuating uh, frame rate between 30 and 60, say, that that tends to look just the same as um, running at 30 the whole time. So you might as well um, save some power and run at that speed. And um, just because you could run at 60 frames per second doesn't mean you maybe should. And if you're uh, writing a fairly slow place of, uh, adventure game, for instance, then you should uh, consider uh, rendering at a slower frame rate, because then you can either make your graphics look nicer or you can use less power. So, um, I'm actually running out of time a little bit here, so I think I might just skip over the next section um, to a certain extent. Um, there's some very uh, basic uh, kind of instructions about your shaders. It's the usual kind of programming techniques. Choose the right algorithm. Know your spaces. Don't get model um, view and uh, world spaces too mixed up, because you'll uh, encounter a lot of um, conversion uh, calculations, which will slow down your work. But, um, yeah, I think I'm running out of time here, so I'm going to skip to the end so that we can have some questions. Okay. All right, Gordon, thank you. Um, we're going to go over some of the questions. Like you said, uh, we do have a lot of them, but I'm going to try to pick some of the quickest to answer. Um, okay. Is blending programmable, and if not, do you plan to support it? Um, at the moment, blending isn't programmable, mostly because of the API. Um, the APIs don't uh, expose that functionality. Um, they're obviously something we've discussed internally. Um, I can't really say anything definite just now, unfortunately. Um, but uh, yeah, in theory, if you're running on a TVDR, then you should be able to do quite a lot of clever stuff because everything's done on chip, um, and we are exploring that kind of possibility. All right. Okay. Um, 
another question. So apart from the architecture, does PowerVR use any load-based clock and voltage scaling in the driver to improve the power? Um, right, that tends to be done on a kind of platform by platform basis. Um, the way we work is we license out uh, an IP core and then uh, an SOC maker actually puts it into an SOC. Um, and so we provide a reference driver and uh, um, I don't think that tends to have a very specific kind of uh, power management um, uh, stuff in it. Uh, but we do see this kind of thing in platforms. Um, I can't go into specifics because it tends to be um, confidential to our actual customers on a platform by platform basis. But it does happen. All right. Um, so another question okay. is, how does profiling work? Most Power VR powered devices are iOS, Android smartphones. And are you able to attach profiler to the iOS device? So how does that work exactly? Okay, uh, on Android, the good news is that our tune, PBR Tune application um, works and is now freely available from our website. Um, in fact, we're improving it you know, uh, all the time. Um, we should have a new release of that ready at the beginning of next month for GDC and get that there. Um, Apple don't expose the functionality required for us to use our own tool, um, but uh, they have their um, instruments uh, application which provides some of the same uh, information through uh, well, their own interface. So you can use that as well. Okay. All right. Um, another question, and I read, uh, this was alluded to but not clarified. If fragments are ordered by depth anyway, why is there a benefit to sending opaque geometry first? Right. It's fairly complicated. Um, and uh, in some ways, it's just something I've been told to always do. I think um, it has to do with uh, the way that um, blended or alpha test objects are dealt with. Because um, we don't just go, oh, no, we've got an alpha test thing. We have to stop, and uh, we'll have to feed everything back. There are quite a lot of optimizations there. I've been specifically told not to say how those work, unfortunately. But it has to do with that. It's kind of the extra optimizations. Uh, uh, extra optimizations which are uh, uh, used with um, the alpha test and the alpha blend um, uh, flat fragments. 